Hello again, Steve Fentress for the Strassenburg Planetarium at the Rochester Museum and Science Center with the sky this week for June 18th to 24th. And this week we'll use our Stellarium software to answer the questions, what is the summer solstice or the June solstice? And later, what is a constellation? So here we are looking at the sky for June 18th at 12 noon. And here is an imaginary line called the meridian. It comes from Latin words meaning middle of the day. The meridian goes from exactly south, directly over your head, to exactly north. And when the sun is on the meridian, that is noon solar time or sundial time. Now we started with the clock set at 12 noon hour daylight saving time, but if we get the sun on the meridian, it's 1300 hours plus about 10 or 12 minutes, 1300 hours, that's 1 p.m. We're, not, we're on daylight saving time, so that accounts for an hour of the difference. But the 12 minutes past 1 o'clock is because we're not exactly in the middle of the eastern time zone. So the sun reaches the meridian on the day of the summer solstice, the day before or after, the 20th or 21st, at about 11 or 12 minutes after 1 p.m. Now I'm hitting the key to advance time by exactly 24 hours. So we're stepping through the summer. It's already August. It's into September now. And we're seeing how every day at about 12 minutes after 1 p.m., the sun is lower and lower. And when will it bottom out? I'll bet you can guess what we in the Northern Hemisphere call first day of winter, the December solstice, usually December 20th or 21st. And then after that, Every day, this midday sun appears higher and higher until it tops out on the first day of summer next June. We can put another imaginary line in the sky, the celestial equator. That's what you get if you push the Earth's equator out onto the sky. And when the sun crosses that line, you have an equinox. Going down, it's the September equinox. Going back up, it's the March equinox. So if we follow the sun through an entire year, we see it reaches its highest possible height on what we call first day of summer, lowest possible height on what we call first day of winter, and the in-between places are what we call first day of spring and first day of fall. Now you may notice as we go through this, the sun is not going straight up and down along the meridian line. It's making a kind of a skinny figure eight. That's called an analemma. And the explanation is that our time system that we've all agreed to use for our clocks and watches is based on the average amount of time that it takes for the sun to go from the meridian to the next meridian crossing, 24 hours. But on any given day, the time varies slightly from that because the Earth does not move in a perfectly steady speed in its orbit. Well, let's now go back to June 18th, and let's look southwest and watch the sun set and see our first stars coming out. Not until late at this time of year, not until about 10 o'clock. So what is a constellation? Well, we look at the stars, and until a couple of hundred years ago, we had no idea that they are other suns out there. We just see them as random-looking points of light. But our human eyes and brains love to see patterns, so we trace these stars and imagine maybe the shape of a backward question mark. And these stars here, and we see a right triangle. And someone, probably somebody in some Sumerian city several thousand years ago, connected these stars and imagine the shape of a lion in the sky. And this lion has been given the name Leo. And so we see on star charts the constellation Leo the lion. Of course, there's not really a lion up there, but it's a shape that helps us imagine, a sh uh, remember those stars because our brains love patterns. Now on official star charts used by astronomers, there are no pictures of lions. There are boundaries like this and a professional astronomer would say any star that's within that boundary that has straight lines meeting at right angles is said to be in the constellation Leo. 
But those boundaries weren't decided on by astronomers until the year 1930. The constellations go back many thousands of years in some cases. Let's look up higher just after sunset for a star group just about everybody's heard of. Officially called the constellation Ursa Major, but if you're a star fan, you probably already recognize a familiar shape inside it, the Big Dipper. If you have a shape that's familiar, has a name, but is not officially recognized as a constellation, it's called an asterism. So you could say the Big Dipper is an asterism within the constellation Ursa Major. Ursa Major is a really mysterious constellation because the stars really don't look like a bear, but they are named after a bear not only in the system of constellations we get from the ancient Near East, but also in many Native American traditions. And here are the official International Astronomical Union boundaries of the constellation Ursa Major. Let's look around just after dark in the last couple of weeks of June for some other constellations. Antares, a bright star, we'll get to that later. The Ophiuchids and June Scutids, those are meteor showers which are really hard to observe, so we'll turn those off for now. Let's look east just as it's getting dark in the summer. And you see three stars here, bright ones. Vega, Deneb, Altair. Skywatchers call that the Summer Triangle. And it's huge in the sky. Here it is as an unofficial asterism. And it has asterisms inside it. Attached to Deneb is the Northern Cross with a staff and a horizontal cross arm. And as an example of another one along the line from Altair to Vega, a little tiny group called the Coat Hanger, really striking in binoculars. But those are asterisms. The official constellations, according to the International Astronomical Union, are Cygnus the Swan, And attached to Vega, Lyra the Lyre, an ancient musical instrument that's an ancestor of our harp and guitar. And attached to Altair, Aquila the Eagle. Those are the big constellations in the realm of the Summer Triangle, but there are little ones too, cute ones. Here's Sagitta the Arrow. and even the adorable Delphinus the dolphin. Examples of constellations, and here are their boundaries. In the realm of the summer triangle, an asterism, a huge triangle, easy to see just after dark facing east. Let's look southeast and stay up a little later, and things get spectacular there. Jupiter is really bright, rising just before midnight with Saturn not far behind. And then some beautiful stars in that same vicinity. Antares, a bright reddish colored star. And near it, a striking curve of three stars, making the head of Scorpius the Scorpion. That's another constellation that goes back to the ancient Near East thousands of years ago. This is how one artist drew the scorpion. I wouldn't draw it that way. There's no one official way you have to do it. And then over to the left of the scorpion's tail, an asterism. Skywatchers call this the teapot. There's the bottom of the teapot, the handle, the lid, and the spout. Pretty easy to recognize. But if you go back thousands of years, oh, coming out of the spout of the teapot, there we go, the Milky Way. Millions and millions of stars making up our galaxy. But the official ancient constellation in this part of the sky, according to the International Astronomical Union, is Sagittarius the Archer, a centaur with a bow and arrow. And here's one artist's interpretation. But there are other interpretations, of course. 
The constellations I've been showing you are the ones that the International Astronomical Union decided on in 1930 just so astronomers could talk to each other in the same language about what star they were referring to. But this Stellarium software is famous for its representation of star lore from many cultures around the world. For instance, the Belarusian constellations and star groups in what we call the Summer Triangle are different. Let's look at some others just to take samples. The ancient Chinese way of looking at the sky had many small constellations, many of them named after uh, functions and offices in government. Just picking some others, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota cultures of North America. See a salamander where we just saw Cygnus the Swan. The Ojibwe interpretation sees a crane where we saw the swan. How about as a completely different interpretation, Romanian constellations. There is much to learn about sky lore from around the world. Some of it is known, some of it is still unknown to scholars, and they are actively researching traditional sky knowledge from around the world. But these are the so-called Western constellations, the ones that you will see on star maps around the world. If you need an international language of star groups, this is the one that is most often used. Well, we're almost done. Let's stay up till dawn because some really familiar welcome friends are coming back. Here we are about four o'clock in the morning in late June. Look at that little bunch of stars close together. That's the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters or try out in the Stellarium software yourself and find some of the many other names that this group has. We haven't seen it since late last spring and now it's coming back and so is the unbelievably bright planet Venus. It was an evening star this spring. It's returning as a morning star this June. Well, we look forward to seeing everyone in the dome just as soon as possible. But in the meantime, thanks for watching our videos and keep an eye on the RMSC video YouTube channel for more.